Hello, friends. Going to do a reading from the Moomon Khan, translated by R.H. Blythe. It's a Zen masterpiece, as you see here. <laughs> a collection of cones with some really interesting commentary and footnotes from Blythe. I have found Zen practice to be a very good complement to individuating and individualism and individuating myself, I should say, in my life and kind of learning to kind of go with the flow. I've explored Taoism and Zen practice. The Taoist religion is, is really more of a folk religion, whereas, you know, what we know from Taoism, a lot of people, a lot of folks come across Lao Tzu and his book. You know, the first thing that it says in there is, the way the the way cannot be written down, the way cannot be spoken, and anyone that says that they know doesn't know, so it's kind of a riddle. But that's more philosophical Taoism, and then there's folk Taoism, which is more of a folk religion, and that's very much centered around magic, good and evil, the story basically, this, the typical kind of religious story found in, in Taoism. But from philosophical Taoism, I, I take I've taken an interesting quite a bit. And I've uh, really been challenged, and, and I've I, I I feel like my life's kind of relaxed quite a bit through through this practice, my own practice. And there's a lot of things out there on the internet. There's a lot of garbage out there, but this is a collection of books that I have that I found from online sources that really kind of are are, are more at the kind of present the heart of the original teachings, or I should say, non-teaching. Of Zen masters, the the Zen have this idea that there's schools within Zen, but they have this idea that you know you're kind of canceling out desire or finding ways to deal with desire and and with and and, and thinking, and it, it it really is I think kind of relates to my to kind of my own philosophical studies with Heidegger recently because Heidegger was definitely influenced by Eastern. And so was Jung. Carl Jung was influenced by the Eastern philosophies, and particularly Zen and Buddhism. But within Zen, there's different flavors and strands. I mean, I definitely am more of a purist when it comes to Zen. I'm not really attached to the Buddhist side of Zen at all, although it did originate there. But Zen rose up as almost like a way to simplify the practice without it being a religion. And this is what really appeals to me. It's a helpful tool in training your mind. And so, anyway, I, I, I'll be doing some readings from some different Zen texts, which obviously are not the thing, <laughs> are not really what what is being talked about or pointed to. The words are just pointers, and contradictions have to be transcendent in the Zen in the Zen practice. And there's a lot of very interesting kind of games or puzzles that you can play with. The great way is gateless. There are a thousand alleys. If once you pass the barrier, you walk alone through the universe. Joshu said to Tosu, The man who has suffered the great death, what kind of living activity is his? Tosu answered, You can't go back in the dark. You have to wait till it's light. This is the bottom of page 20. Both in character and life, Joshu was a man of extreme simplicity. When, for example, the leg of a chair broke, he did not have it repaired in the proper way, but had a stake bound to it. One of his most famous sayings, not understood by one person in a hundred, is the following. When a sincere man expounds a mistake in doctrine, the doctrine becomes true. When an insincere man expounds a true doctrine, it becomes error. A monk asked, Who or what is Joshu? Joshua answered, East gate, West gate, South gate, North gate. That is to say, if you want to come and see me, you can do so from any and every direction. All the gates are open. There is no concealment. In fact, it is all gate and nothing else. Joshu gave out three problems to his monks. A mud Buddha cannot pass through water. A metal Buddha cannot pass the furnace. A wooden Buddha cannot pass through fire. What is then the Buddha that can do this? But the best example of a transcendent simplicity is that of the 19th case of the Mumon Khan. Your everyday mind, that is the way. 
Outside this, there is no Buddhism. One last anecdote. A man of high rank named Oyo came to ask for instruction in Zen. Joshu said, Having fasted from my youth, my body is already old, and I have not the strength to get off the chair to greet people. Then remaining silent for a time, he said, Do you understand? Oyu did not understand. Did not understand properly. But feeling the power of Joshu's words, exclaimed, What a rare master you are truly. The next day, he sent a servant, and Joshu rose from his seat and greeted him. The head monk thought this very strange behavior and asked Joshu why he treated the man of lower rank so ceremoniously. Joshu said, If a first-class man comes, I greet him from the chair. If a middle-class man comes, I arise. If a third-class man comes, I go outside the temple to greet him. This is greatness and simplicity indeed. All right, this is the uh, first case in the Mumon Khan. And uh, this is on uh, page 22. A monk once asked Joshu, Has a dog the Buddha nature? Joshu answered, Moo, no. In the sayings of Joshu, which this case seems to be taken, we have a much fuller account. A monk asked Joshu whether a dog had the Buddha nature or not. He said, no. The monk said, all creeping things with life have the Buddha nature. How can it be that the dog had not? Joshu answered, you are attached to thoughts and emotions arising from karmic ignorance. Again, a monk asked him, has a dog a Buddha nature or not? Joshu answered, yes. The monk said, you say yes, but how did it get into the skin bag, the dog's body? Joshu said, knowingly and purposely, he said. This is a reading from page on page 32 of the Muman Khan. This is the commentary for case one. Case one presents a story, a famous story relating to Joshu, Zhao Zhao, one of, um, one of my favorite Zen masters of the past. He's kind of a master, a negative master, a master without being a master. Well, I mean, he, he, he was a master, but he kind of took the kind of an upside down fool's approach to it, which I actually relate quite, quite a lot to. So, all right. All the useless knowledge, all the wrong things you've learned up to the present, throw them away. After a certain period of time, this striving will come to fruition naturally. In a state of internal and external unity, as with a dumb man who's had a dream, you will know it yourself and for yourself only. Suddenly, your whole activity is put into motion, and you can astonish the heavens above and shake the earth beneath. You are just as if you had got a hold of the great sword of Kanu. You meet a Buddha, you kill him. A master of Zen, you kill him. Though you stand on the brink of life and death, you have the great freedom. In the four modes of the six rebirths, you are in a state of peace and truth. Once more, how are you to concentrate on this moo? Every ounce of energy you have must be expended on it. And if you do not give up on the way, another torch of the law will be lighted. All right. Continuing on page 33 of the Muman Khan. This is the commentary from case one. Cutting off the workings of the ordinary mind. The road of the mind is relativity for the intellect. Likes and dislikes for the emotions. The mind sees everything under the form of this and that, here and there, is and is not. And to this, the emotions add the coloring of gain and loss, desirable and undesirable, good and bad. But what kind of picture shall we see when form and color are both removed? I hath not seen. This is what passing the barrier of Zen in this life means. A phantom among undergrowth and weeds. According to ideas prevalent among the Chinese, some spirits go neither to heaven nor to hell, wandering about and feeding aimlessly on garbage. This is the condition of the man who feeds on the newspapers, on murders and wars, rumors of wars, who rejoices when his side wins, and whose life becomes meaningless when it loses. When you have passed the barrier, though, you rejoice in the truth. You rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. In everything, you see the working of one mind. But if you have not passed the barrier, your mind is ghostly, hoping and fearing. There is no balance, no immovable point of activity. 360 bones, etc. 
Mistakes of science are just as unimportant in Buddhism as in Christianity. Mistakes of psychology, that is quite another matter. The above has, of course, the meaning of with all your heart and soul and strength. This question is the problem of Buddha nature. That is, of Mu. Useless knowledge, literally bad knowledge, is really unused knowledge. If any organ of the body or matter taken into it is not used, disease at once supervenes. So all the accumulated head knowledge, dogmas, religious and otherwise, principles of morality, theories of life, unless put into practice, are worse than useless. They are bad. They, are, they rot the mind. If you meet a, bullet, a Buddha, kill him. A master of Zen, kill him. This killing of the Buddhas and the patriarchs in Zen is in marked con contrast to the attitude of the other Buddhist sects and to that of Christianity. The Buddha conceived as something, apart from ourselves, becomes like Christ, an enemy of mankind, public enemy number one, all the more because he is righteous and worthy of imitation, for imitation is death. Kanu, who died in 220 AD, is the Chinese Mars. His sword was called Green Dragon. He was a hero of the three kingdoms, had a beard one foot, eight inches long, and was said to be nine feet, five inches tall. He appears in the Japanese Boys Festival. The adept of Zen is compared to this man because he went about doing as he liked, this being due to his physical and spiritual strength. So the Zen man, feeble in body and poor in spirit, is master of every situation. Whoever plays, God always wins. Nature never loses. This is the thusness of things with which he is identified. This, his strength is such that he lifts the sun above the eastern hills and drops it slowly below the horizon at dusk. He turns the globe itself, yet makes the duck's legs short and crane legs long.